Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. This is Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. I'm Eric, the IT guy, uh, Hendrix, and I'll be your host today. And joining me just about every episode is one of my favorite people in the Rel BU, Mr. Brian Smith. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Well, it's been a day, let me tell you. Uh, about a day and a half or so, we've uh, we've been having some internet issues. There was a power surge at our house last week. We thought we had the issue fixed with with uh, with our fiber provider, and well, let's just say that today's live stream is being brought to you by uh, my Verizon hotspot because my laptop is hooked up to my iPad, and so if if I just drop off the face of the world, uh, know that I'm okay, and just will rejoin you shortly. So. Um, I did want to point out one quick thing before we get into today's topic. Uh, if you're watching us live or if you're watching us after the fact, please share and like and subscribe to this content. Um, I've seen a decrease in long form content, and I don't know about y'all, but I listen to a ton of podcasts, watch a lot of content while I'm uh, work, working out at the gym. Uh, right now, it's been like Fedora Flock 2023 content, but uh, let's... Let's uh, show some love to long form content. Uh, you know, if you've seen our content before, that uh, you're you're in for a ride for the whole hour. So, really appreciate uh, all of you showing your love and support for what uh, what we do. Um, but uh, with that said, Brian, why don't you introduce today's uh, topic for us? Yeah, so we have a couple of special guests that we're going to be talking to today um, from Avasa, talking about edge management. So, super excited to have um, you know some special guests on today. Yeah, so why don't we uh, dive in and we'll introduce Carl and Frederick. Welcome to Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, so so Carl and Frederick, can you introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about what you do and then um, kind of what Avasa is as well? Sure. I'll start because I'm taller than Frederick, so I'll, I'll just go. <laughs> I'm, I'm Carl. I'm the CTO of Avasa and one of the co-founders. And I know everybody says like CTO, it don't even know what that is. And in this company, it means that I'm not the best developer, but I do talk quite a bit in environments like this and with customers and partners and other. And I work closely with our product team to kind of guide where we're going with the product. Over to, uh, to you, Frederick. Thank you, sir. So I'm Frederick Jensen. I'm a solution architect with Avasa. Um, that means I work with customers, of course. I work closely with product management, uh, run features in the product, and, and in general, trying to get our customers up on the platform as, as quick as possible. Awesome. Really excited to have you both here. And uh, so today we're talking about edge container management, which uh, a lot of people immediately think Kubernetes and OpenShift. But uh, one of the things that got all of us talking about uh, about having you on the show was the fact that Red Hat Enterprise Linux actually has a really, really standout solution for edge deployments. Um, so we'll we'll talk about uh, and and in fact I, I forgot to mention off, off the top of the show that this is one of our partner focused episodes. So Avasa is a partner of Red Hat, and we work together. Um, more specifically, our engineering teams work pretty closely together. So I'm I'm really excited to dive into this topic. But here's the problem: no matter what circle you're in, you always end up with a situation of everyone has their own definition of of different pieces of technology, different technology concepts. So I, I feel obliged for our audience to level set first and define what is the edge? What are we talking about? As, as you should. And, uh, you know, this company was founded in late 2019, maybe early 2020. And we had not realized at the time how <laughs> burnt to the ground that term is and how that would oh, actually so be. <laughs> it, it, it is. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it since like software defined networking or something. Um, and how much time we, I, we've actually spent on, on, on doing just this. And I've, I've actually challenged other vendors, particularly in like event presentations to see who can do it the fastest. Right. So we don't spend 15 out of 60 minutes in every presentation across three days of presentations. Right. And what we've taken to say is that what we mean by edge, we usually start by saying that usually everything that has to do with computers outside of the data centers. Um, so, so that's the general term. And of course, being a little self-centered, you know, talking about the kind of type of in infrastructure that we actually target. What we usually say is that it's general compute platforms. So it's not your you know, IoT devices of old with 
you know, real-time like, firmware-based operating systems. Certainly not the, the mobile phone or anything like that. And it's not things in data centers where you have racks and racks, but it's everything in between. And people usually ask for examples, and I'll humor them by saying things like, you can think of a retail store, you can think of a cruise ship, you can think of a healthcare provider, you know, location. Um, you can think of um, actually mining environments. And I guess the cool thing here is that we center our whole world around, and we'll get to this, I guess, in more detail, certainly around the ability to manage containerized applications. So that, that also gives kind of a, a nice technical boundary. Anything that can run containerized applications um, that's not in a data center um, is usually what we call by edge. And of course, a number of location inevitably comes into play, right? It's not an edge unless you have at least a couple of tens, maybe a hundreds of locations. Before that, it's just a set of small, small data centers or small hobby clusters. So I don't know, maybe that's a, a way for me to run around the definition and kind of try to. You know, <laughs> no, I think that's great. So so what are, what are some of the unique challenges with Edge? Like, why, why is this any different than just running a computer in a data center? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, fundamentally, you know, things that, I mean, if, if we try to ju just talk about things that is part of the definition, then there's, I would say that there's two things. One is that location matters, which is yeah, for some people actually kind of mind blowing. See what I mean? Because many of us are brought up with, it doesn't actually matter that much where the computer that's hosting my application sits as long as it's in the same continent and it's well connected, i.e. the cloud or the data center. In all the verticals that we talk about here for this kind of edge, people put these computers in this geographical location normally, you know, discounting for ships that move but they put it in this lo physical location for a reason. So location actually carries meaning. And that actually has broader and deeper ramifications than what people think. One of those is, for example, you don't fail over a point of sale system from Stockholm, which is outside the window here, to London, because the customer is not there. There is a point to why this point of sale system is running downtown Stockholm. So I think, in, in my humble opinion, the fact that location matters is really, really key. Location is a first class criteria or first class something that you have to take into account. And that actually hits the topic of deployment and placement and scheduling. It hits monitoring and observability. It hits survivability and resiliency. So I think that is probably the one most fundamental kind of almost architectural aspect of this. And, and again, it's kind of per definition, because if you don't have locations, then it's not really the edge, right? So it's a, also a circular <laughs> circular argument, uh, if you like. The second thing, which is, I guess, a little more pragmatic, a little more experience-based, is that most, if not all, edge locations that I've you know, worked with lack the type of perimeter security that data centers have. You know, in many of the cases that we talk about here, there are no armed guards, locked doors, cages, you know, alarm systems. It's a fairly exposed environment. It doesn't, it's not true for everything, but if you, again, if you think of things like retail, quick serve restaurants, um, environments like that, it's actually pretty horribly exposed. And that has also deep ramifications for the security posture. You know, we usually talk about protecting data at flight and um, at rest, in flight and at rest. You know, a mind blowing insight for some of our users have been like, there is an actual chance that someone will literally steal the computer that my application is running on and, 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 and go home with it or go to some weird lab with it. Now, how, how does that actually impact the way we think about, um, the way we think about, uh, you know, designing these applications and protecting the data? And maybe because I can't forget it, you know, kind of, a a point 0.5 to the first one is also resiliency, right? The fact that if you have a footprint big enough in terms of edge locations, you know, if, if you're in the thousands, you're gonna always have like 10 of them is going to be offline for reasons that is usually a mix of things that you, you can control. So controlled offline and some things that are catastrophic. And that also impacts how you design applications because if you have a three-way redundant, you know, uh, you know full close mesh, data center with DNS resolvers in every rack and all that kind of stuff, you know, as a developer, as an application operations person, you never have to take into account that you may run out of 
memory, you may run out of disk, you may not reach your container registry. So maybe that's the point five to the first one is that with location also comes resiliency requirements. Um, there you go, one point or 2.5 reasons why we think Edge <laughs> is, uh, is different here. <laughs> So we we actually talked a bit uh, at the edge, and uh, and your your explanation has this beat. But back in episode fifty two of Rel Presents, we actually talked about Red Hat Enterprise Linux at the edge, yeah. um, and, and not not to be unfair, but to throw this back in your corner, uh, if if our if our audience is interested, go check out that episode. Uh, we'll throw the link in chat. Uh, but if uh, if you had to if you had to sell our product, if you had to go and pitch Red Hat. Uh, uh, for the edge, what uh, what what would you say? Try and figure out how to word this. How does Avasa <laughs> view uh, yeah. Rel for the edge? Yeah. So as much as we, I mean, we have a, a long and winding background actually as a, as a, as a team in building infrastructure automation. Um, we are very very explicit about the fact that Avasa, we focus on the on the application layer. We focus on the lifecycle management of containerized applications. And we really try to stay more or less away from the infrastructure. The backside of that is that we have to run on something. We can't run on thin app operating system, you know, th this kind of emerging you know, set of technologies, um, which Rel on Edge is an excellent example of. There were no coherent and trustworthy, you know, uh, to be honest, frameworks for that. So when we talk to customers that have 19,000 locations, right? So CVE hits, right? Just, I mean, two years ago, how would you go about doing that? Honestly, none of the frameworks pitched by the larger vendors were built for 19,000 locations. They were built for 19 servers, a rack in a couple of locations, right? But they didn't really scale to that kind of criteria based rolling, you know, hitless upgrades. So for us, as Rel on Edge, you know, you guys announced that, that gave us a resounding answer to that. And of course, we've worked diligently, like you guys said then, to say, look, we integrate well enough with Rel on Edge and Podman that we, you can do rolling upgrades, for example, across large swaths of installed infrastructure without impacting the lifecycle of the applications, because we cleverly know how to reschedule applications instead of clusters as Rel on Edge does its thing. So for us, it's the fundamental response to the question, how about the operating system? That pesky operating system, right? Uh, at scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the, the RPM OS tree technology that Rel for Edge is built on. And it's just, it's just an incredibly useful tool. Like when you're doing operating system updates, you know, if something goes wrong, you can, you know, reboot and fail over, you know, to the previous image just with a reboot. And it even has the things like, like green boot that allow you to have those health checks when it boots up so you can make sure your applications are up. And if not, even automate the process of failing back, you know, to the previous version of operating system. So it's just a really exciting technology, um, you know, that really solves a lot of real world, real world problems. And, and specifically, a lot of the challenges that people see on the edge, when like, like you were saying, when you have these, you, know, you might have a site where, you know, it's, you know, a thousand miles away from, from where you are, and you don't want to have to go there and pull up a console to, you know, reboot the system because it, it didn't, you know, the operating system update didn't work or something, so. Absolutely, and as you can imagine, it all needs to be managed from a central vantage point and monitored and observed. So it, it just has to be, because not only is it a thousand miles away from me, it's a thousand miles from anyone with any IT training in many of these verticals, right? So you simply can't fail that and, and talk about, you know, bricking at scale, right? If you would try to do this with uh, solutions that didn't have that rollback cap capabilities and kind of belts and suspenders uh, built in. And again, tr you know, again, uh, maybe maybe this is, uh, I don't even know, we, we may have to come up with some new terms. I love how, um, you know, during the cloud conversation, people started talking about, you know, pets versus cattle. Uh, and this is more like cattle cattle, right? So you have to literally treat large swaths of, of compute as a, a, you know, cattle, right? Um, and that's what the hybrid hybrid um, uh, the portal does for us, uh, the Red Hat solution here does for us. So not only the actual operating system, but the way you allow us to manage that, which uh, Frederick will, will um, demo here uh, in a moment, how we, how we do that. Yeah, sounds good. So before we get to the demo, why don't why don't you guys talk a little bit more about like you know what what 
what are the reasons you, you founded Avaso? Like, who are your target user, users? What problems are you trying to solve? And just, sure. and just a little bit of background on that. Yeah, for sure. So actually, we've already touched on some of these things. Um, again, we have a long background in, in building distributed systems for orchestration and automation of the of the infrastructure. And uh, we had the opportunity to work with a lot of enterprises in our previous uh, roles. And what I found during those conversations was that the interest kind of um, focus was moving slowly away from the infrastructure and into the application layer, particularly, you know, managing the life cycle of applications outside of the game, uh, the private and the public hyperscaler clouds, right? Because they were, they felt pretty well solved, but as soon as they were running applications outside of, outside of the data center, they struggled mightily. And it kind of impacted two teams, right? There's always a, some sort of IT, you know, some of them want to be called platform teams these days, right? They care deeply for the infrastructure. They love, you know, designing, deploying, and, you know, operating resilient and secure infrastructure. Um, that's what they, that's what they do all day, every day. And their, at times, counterparts is something we could, you know, maybe call the application team, you know, people that care deeply about the application and, and at times care much, much less about the infrastructure than you would think. Um, as long as it can run the applications, they're, they're good, they're fine. The interesting thing here is that, you know, um, of course, the application teams are normally most aligned with, you know, the, the business, the lines of business, the value stream, whatever you want to call it, what, whatever the company does is usually expressed in the software, you know, that, the, that these application teams carry. So they are important and actually increasingly important. And what we found was that in the generation of kind of edge infrastructure that was built up until, you know, we, we started thinking about it, wasn't particularly well built for the application teams. Uh, we literally had a, a retailer here in Sweden tell us that they still they were still literally sending USB sticks to update the applications inside of the retail store. So, you know, this, they, they could do like feature releases in their cloud footprint in half a day. But they only had two upgrade cycles for their, you know, for their actual stores. And that was by sneaking at USB sticks. Hmm. And of course, that's pretty nasty, right? So what we wanted to do here was that we wanted to build an automation and orchestration platform with monitoring and observability capabilities that would make these, you know, this, this distributed edge infrastructure be as easy to address and work with as the perception of the cloud. So maybe another way of saying it is that we've built tooling to allow the platform and IT teams and the application teams to extend their current capabilities to the edge. And the nuance here is that they shouldn't swivel chair. That's another thing, right? So we've seen a lot of enterprises that have one, you know, IT operation stack for the for the cloud, for the central cloud, and one IT operation stack for the for the edge. And of course, you know, many applications have components in both. So that's a terrible thing. Swivel sharing is horrible. Even worse is when they're two different teams. And, and of course, our vision and idea here is that let's build something that integrates really well with the existing operation stack that the IT and application teams already have. So they can do more of what they do well, and they can treat the edge as something with as low barrier for deployment and monitoring and observability as they perceive the cloud to be. Hope that, does that make sense, Brian, to you? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah. And uh, maybe just to follow up, then, you know, the interesting thing with having built a, a horizontal platform, because that's what we've done, is that we get to work with a number of verticals, right? Because this, when you start wearing those glasses, like where's software running, who's in charge of software running in many locations, you'll find that it's, 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 I wouldn't say everywhere, but it, there, that's evident in more locations than what you think. So we pretty much want to work with any enterprise that does that, but the ones that are maybe most pronounced, again, is things like retail, our beloved quick serve restaurants, um, healthcare, industrial and manufacturing, uh, marine, you know, oil and gas or energy companies, you know, any, any kind of enterprise environment where there is a strong requirement to run applications in many locations. So... I don't know about y'all, but I'm I'm a very visual person. So and, and and poor Frederick has just been sitting there waiting for his chance to shine. So straight back, yeah. I'm, I've got a I've got a, a, a proposal here. Why don't we dive into the tool and we can talk about hardware requirements and uh, some of the use cases as we go. But I, I kind of want to see uh, I want to see what uh, what Avasa looks like. 
Sure. And I'm actually going to pull up I'm the screen share. Actually, let me <coughs> let me <clears throat> steal that from you guys because I, I, oh, I'm sure. going to do like the, the first first easy part and then Frederick is going to do, I guess, the hard part. Except, Carl, I just lost your screen share. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. How about this? There it is. There awesome. we go. Thank you and apologies. Okay. Because I, I want to be, uh, you know, again, a, a smooth introduction here. So we're, what we're looking at here is a, is a web UI, obviously, to what a central, our central control plane, something called the control tower. Our solution actually consists of two pieces of software, one that we're looking at right now. And where the demo will happen, I'm going to use the web UI extensively. There's also a command line interface and a set of REST API endpoints. I, I think Frederick may touch on the command line face, com command line interface eventually. Mm -hmm. This part of the system provides again all the interaction points that both IT or platform teams and application teams interact with. The second piece of software, and this is what I just wanted to mention, is an agent. Let's call it an agent. So it's something we call the edge enforcer. We don't sell hardware. Uh, we partner with you guys for the operating system layer. So when the hardware is installed, when the Relon Edge is installed. Uh, our users or customers go ahead and install, you know, the Edge Enforcer. And it's actually a containerized application. So they stand it up on top of Podman. It actually reads quite a bit of information from SM BIOS, DMI, and UDEV to understand what kind of platform are we running on here? What are some of the resources available um, to the applications running on top of this system? And then it calls home. It reports that data. It does a couple of authentication and authorization steps. And then it's done. Right, so at that point, we can now start monitoring and observing that host, that Relon Edge instance, if you like, independent of whether it's on, you know, bare metal or in virtual machines or whatever it is. And um, we also, and more importantly, we can start deploying applications to it. So I just wanted to say that the outline here is that there's a there's a control plane um, <coughs> here, and there's a small agent running on each each host. <clears throat> So what I wanted to show you, kind of the, the really quick fly over here before we head into uh, the more advanced uh, features and also the interaction with uh, with the Elon Edge is just to briefly click through the definition of a site here. So if I hit Berlin, for example, we can see that there's a single host in that site and we can start looking into the operational state and some of the, the available resources for that particular host. So as you can see here, you know, this is actually running um, on an Amazon EC2. So we're cheating a little bit for some bits and pieces of this of this demo. Frederick will get to the um, Relon Edge side of things. But we pick up a lot of things around about what kind of uh, ABI, how much resources do we have. There are no GPUs, obviously, and no devices attached. But we pick up a significant amount of whatever inventory, let's say, is connected um, to this particular computer. And we also have a couple of labels for this site, right? So this is site level labels. Um, so things like someone who knows has said that this is a site of size medium. It's in Europe. Actually, it's in, it's in Germany to be very specific. So we have a good understanding of what's there and we have a good understanding of what is it that this can this can provide to us. And of course, as, a, as an IT or a platform person, what you care mostly about is that all my sites are green and that um, they're all reachable, available. They seem to have resources enough to run containers. We'll look a little bit more on the details here as I hand over to Frederick, but I just wanted to show you the basic interaction between um, this kind of site and how you deploy applications to it. So we have something called an application specification. So the good thing with starting a company fairly recently is that you can steal heavily or borrow from the generally well understood definition of an application in the container world, right? So there's a lot of prior art here that we could deliberately um, steal from. So you can think of our application specification as something equivalent maybe to a Docker compose file or maybe a pod in Kubernetes. So we name things, right? So in our case, this application will, will, will be called visitor counter. We put a version to it. And as you can see here, we have two types of users, one on the left, which loves the web UI, and one on the right that would rather work in YAML or JSON. And demo-wise, I'm going to show you kind of both here. Applications have services. 
So we named this service visitor counter service. And of course, in this world, services is just, you know, the, the, the container images that need to be scheduled on the same host. And I'm just going to make the simplest possible um, application here. It's a single container application. And I put the URL to the um, container image. This, this happens to reside in our you know, public demo registry. And in centralized environments, if you click Submit here, what happens is usually if you're running on Docker or Kubernetes, you start the application. But again, location matters, right? So the next step for us is to say where, because none of our users run all the applications with the same configuration in all locations at the same time, right? They actually have a selective criteria that can be based on geography, but it can also be based on things like if you have an object detection machine learning server, you probably want a camera you may want a slice of a GPU. So let, let's think about it as constraint-based scheduling. I'm just going to show you some really simple um, examples, examples of that. But the first thing is that we want to make sure that we found the container image, because we pull that into our internal registry, because we can't rely on outside uh, you know, co connections with uh, external registries at all times. So we keep it inside of our own internal registry infrastructure. And I happen to recognize this build shell so that I can, I can trust that this is the one that I aim to run. And the way you describe to this system um, where to run this application is to create what we call an application deployment. So that's a separate step. And we think this is going to be key how, to how these kinds of systems work. They have names. So I'll call this the visitor counter deployment. And I point to an application from our application registry here. So that's going to be visitor counter. I'm going to say I'm going to deploy version 1.0. And then comes the placement part of things. So in this case, I'm just going to make it very simple. I'm going to say we're going to deploy this to region Europe or where we match region Europe or, or region Asia. It's an item potent system. So we're matching on 15. It's a clean, you know, it's an empty edge cloud. So we're going to add 15 of them. Most people want to use some sort of cannery stage. They want to trial it somewhere or try it somewhere. We're going to make that a manual action and say, let's run this in Finland first. So we're going to match on Helsinki. So created an application, a very, very simple one. And now I'm telling the system, here are the circumstances under which I want this to be running. And let's try it out in Finland first. So I'm going to submit that and hop over to my operational view. So here you'll see that Helsinki is now being deployed. So we pull the container image into the local cluster because we need to be able to, for example, restart the, the container if there's an upstream outage. So we need the container image in a local registry endpoint. And now it's up and running. And what we can do is click through to the actual running instance in the Helsinki location and, and just see that, OK, this is actually up and running, looks good. You know, Probes are passed, no restarts. And we can be mean to it. We can log into with a terminal into the actual container, not the host, because this is a multi-tenant system. So host access is very exclusive. So now I'm inside the container. And I can see that the visitor's command, as I, I happen to know, that that's the command for the container. So if I kill that, that's going to exit the container. And if you watch closely here, you're going to see the restart count um, be counted up because the local scheduler will actually find that it's, it's exited and restart it. So here we go with, an, with a restart count, but we pass the probes immediately, so we're up and running again. Hmm. And we can inspect the logs to make sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So I'm just going to briefly look at the logs since two minutes and just make sure that it's actually counting visitors again. So that looks good. I'm happy that it survived that. And we can go back to the deployment and hit Continue. And it's going to start rolling out across the other uh, 14 sites here. So I created the, the application, you know, created a definition of where to run it, did a, did a, a, a cannery, and now we're up and running uh, across almost all. You know, actually, we have two real live clusters here, and they're going to take another moment or two. No, now they're actually up. So that's kind of the, the flyover. So at the heart of the system, before I hand over to Frederick, is the definition of an application that looks a lot like a Docker Compose file, and the definition of a deployment, which is a formal definition of where to run or under which circumstances to run this, and other you know deployment-related things like a cannery stage. Does that make sense as the basis here, guys? Before we head into the into the cool stuff. Yeah, this this feels very uh, 
Kubernetes esque, and, and I believe you all mentioned uh, Podman. Yeah. <clears throat> so this yeah. is this is running uh, Podman under the hood then. This is this is that's exactly right. So the only requirement that we have, or the only few requirements that we have, is that it's, that it's a reasonably modern Linux, and that there's a container runtime. And of course, in this demo, it's Podman, um, and that's literally all you need, right? The container that we stand up, the the agent does the rest of it, right? And the reason why we did it that way is kind of two. Uh, the first one was that we wanted to build something that feels like a pass like a platform as a service. And since we don't have time for that, there's a lot of things that we won't have to time to cover here. We have deep multi-tenancy, we have secrets management, we have monitoring and observability, all those kinds of things. And when we try to build that with Kubernetes, we realized that Kubernetes is one thing, very important at the heart of this, but we were looking at you know 15 to 20 additional pieces of software to get to that, right? And that would mean that a system like this would probably concern itself more with the life cycle of the actual Kubernetes cluster rather than the life cycle of the applications, right? So if you mm -hmm. want to think about it, this is actually something that has the applications as the root object and where it's running as kind of a secondary thing. So that was one thing. The operational overhead is, is fairly crazy if you want to actually provide a, a broader stack like that. The second thing was that you know the Kubernetes APIs are literally designed for centralized environments, right? So you can either run a lot of Kubernetes at the edge and then reinvent something like what we have centrally. But I'll tell you now that you are going to have to fight the Kubernetes APIs, you know, as that central uh, location, um, tooth and nail when it comes to things like monitoring, observability, you know, tenancy, all that kind of stuff, because it was never built for it. Or you can put the control pane in the middle and you will lose the idea of having location as a primary uh, object, because it literally breaks everything in Kubernetes heart and soul if you can't move things between pods or between um, nodes, right? You will have to start doing horrible, horrible things. And you literally can't cluster per site, for example, because that would mean that you would have to violate the clustering architecture of Kubernetes. So long story short, we couldn't actually make it work in a way that was as convenient as I hope this was perceived, you know, this was, <laughs> This was appreciated to be. Um, so we said, you know, I we don't think the actual detailed nature of the runtime is important. We think the developer or you know user experience is what's important and the ease of integration with existing tools. Um, so that's the, the long and short story of it. And as you can imagine, it is for sure at the top of our frequently asked questions all over the place, you know. So it, it is a fairly frequently asked question, but it, you know it, it's it's a fairly undramatic choice on our, <clears throat> actually on our part. That's really cool. Now, Frederick, I think uh, you sir win the award for the longest someone has had to sit on the stream without getting some some spots. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. as a as a former uh, solutions architect, uh, I'm really excited to see what you brought for us. I I actually have not seen any of this demo, so I'm. I tell people I do these I do these live streams because I like to learn and meet new people. Um, so I'm really excited to see what you what you're going to bring to uh, what you're going to bring to us. Awesome! Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try to live up to that. Um, <laughs> so so I'm logged into the same system as Carl was in, so you can actually see the visitor counter he just deployed here. Uh, what so our customers when they they bring on their their first application and their first version of their application just as carl did they typically click in the ui to to get a feel for the system so for the rest of the demo i will actually start by uh, looking at how you upgrade applications in our system and kind of segue that into uh, upgrade of the operating system where where rel for edge comes in so what I want to do is I want to take the visitor counter and bring that up to version 2.0. So what I'll do and, and brace for impact now is I'm actually going to run most of this from the terminal. So I'm going to switch over here. And the reason I do this uh, is that you typically want to tie this into a CI CD pipeline. And our command line tool is, is a great way of doing that. So what I've prepared here is I've actually created a visitor counter 2.0 uh, YAML file that I have sitting on my on my hard drive. 
And as you can see, I've, I've added quite a few things to this one from the version that Carl has. It's uh, a new version of the image itself. It actually needs uh, a couple of uh, secrets to function. I won't dwell too much on that. One thing I want to I wanna mention before moving forward is we have a feature in the platform called delayed shutdown that comes into play. So our customers, we, for example, we have a customer that deploys SIP servers when they have live traffic, uh, live voice traffic going on their application. So when they do application upgrades, or as I will show you uh, when we talk about the operating system, when they wanna migrate applications from one host to another, they have to make sure that the, the ongoing uh, calls are not interrupted by the update or the move to a new host. We call that delayed shutdown. In in this demo, I'm actually just sleeping for 20 seconds. In the real world, they actually run this command to see had they run out of sessions on this particular instance of the SIP server, for example. But in, but in this case, it will just sit there for 20, 20 seconds just to show what it looks like. Um, so that's the only thing I've really planned to to point out in this in this application specification. But let me start talking. I'll quit this one, and now I'm going to use our command line tool, which is called subctl. So everything you can do in the UI, you can do in this one. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a replace applications visitor counter. I'm going to get this version in. Oops. Let me fix this one. This is uh, my Mac acting up. Let's hope I didn't have any more of this. It's because you're using light mode instead of dark mode. <laughs> Burn. Burn. <laughs> so that's how I get the new version into the system. Uh, I can actually monitor, see if I got my... So a lot of things here. What I'm actually looking for is, is this one. So this tells me that it was able to download uh, the new image. <coughs> and it took about four seconds to do that. So now the system is, is locked and loaded with a, with a new version. So let's uh, get it to actually, since it needs secrets, I'm going to edit my, my vault. Actually, let me switch to the UI and show you what I'm talking about. So as you may have seen here in, in this application specification, it reads uh, secrets from a secret vault. Hmm. So what I need to do is I'm, I'm going to go to this vault called operations, and I'm going to tell the system to distribute this secret together with this particular application. So I have a choice of distributing uh, these secrets to all the sites that I have. Uh, but here I'm actually opting in and saying it's only this application that needs these uh, particular secrets. So I'm going to let the secret go wherever the application goes by doing this. So I'm going to submit this one. And now I'm going to head back into this guy. So. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to edit the application deployment. This counter deployment. So I get this in editor. And here I'm just going to say, please go ahead and deploy version 2.0. Save this. Switch back into the UI. Going to look at the deployment. This counter, it's rolling out to Helsinki. So now we're actually in the in the canary stage, exactly the same thing that that Carl showed you. So here it did an upgrade from 1.0 to 2.0, and it's actually sitting here waiting now for for me as an operator to go to Helsinki, make sure things are up and running. Carl kind of went through that, showing the logs, going into the container and all that. So I'm just gonna assume that everything is good. So I'm, I'm gonna hit continue deployment here. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to go back into my application here and I'm going to find this uh, rel on edge site, which is actually the site we're going to use for, for the demo. 
So there are a couple of things that I'm I'm interested in here. So I can see I'm running version 2.0. I can see that I'm running it on, on the host RE1. So I'm going to go here to my site. So I'm going to find this Relonet site. And I get pretty much the same view here. So I, on RE1, the first host in this cluster, I can actually see that I'm running this particular instance of the application. So I'm, I'm seeing a question here that I might answer. Uh, are only container runtime supported and a way to direct process ex execution on the machines? So today we support Docker and Podman, uh, and that's what we support. There are some tricks you can do from a container to go to the host to, to execute commands on the host, uh, but the platform in itself supports uh, container runtimes. So I hope that answers that question. Okie doke. So here we have the cluster, uh, three machines, RE1, RE2, RE3. I'm running my service instance on, on this particular instance. And now I'm going to do another switch. Now I'm going to go into the Red Hat console. So again, you can see these uh, three machines. What I've done uh, before the demo is I've prepared a new version of the image. So I have a couple of images here in the system and all these RE1 through three are running this uh, Red Hat 9.2 image. And I've just prepared a, a version seven about four hours ago that I wanna do an upgrade to. And so let me go back into systems here. So if I want to do an upgrade now, the operating system with minimal impact of my, of my applications running there, I'm going to go back in here and I can see that, so on RE1, I'm actually running this particular application. So I know that if I just download a new version of the, of the operating system and reboot this one, that will actually affect my application running on that machine. So what we built in, uh, to the system is a, a couple of features, and the one I'm going to use is called Drain, Host, and Reschedule. This tells the system to go into a blocked mode. That means that the local scheduler will look at this host and see that it shouldn't take any new applications, should there come in a new application as we do this. And it will also try to move any application running on that particular host to a new host. So I'm going to click this one, and then I'm quickly going to go back into applications and select uh, this one again. So now you can see I'm actually having two instances here. So it's starting up the new version on Red Hat 2 on that host. And this one is in that delayed shutdown mode uh, that I talked about. Again, I'm, I'm cheating here. It's just sitting here for 20 seconds waiting for it to exit. But in the real world, this will actually wait for, for sessions to drain out. And once those sessions has drained out, uh, this one will actually be stopped. And maybe if I refresh here, uh, it's going to sit here for a short while. So one of the things that comes to mind is that uh, when we think about the edge, a lot of times we're thinking about very small machines scattered mm -hmm. across the globe. So what what are some of the hardware hardware requirements uh, for an edge host to be running uh, Avasa tools? Obviously, mm -hmm. you've got the the hardware requirements for something like uh, something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but uh, what what uh, requirements and recommendations do you have? This the smallest system that we have successfully run it on, and and with successfully I mean so you got to fit the operating system, you're gonna fit our agent, which consumes maybe a hundred megabytes of, of RAM. You're probably gonna end up with a with a machine with at least one gigabyte of memory to have a to meaningfully I mean be able to run some kind of application on top of it. So I, I would say a, a gigabyte of RAM. Uh, we consume. Uh, maybe around 200 megabytes of, of disk. And then you have the operating system on top of that. 
CPU wise, we don't really do much. I mean, we monitor, make sure the the containers up and running. We we uh, get the logs and store those and and all that, but we don't really consume a whole lot of of CPUs. So, what we typically say is is size your machine for the application you want to run, and we can kind of run on the spare fumes, so to say, when it comes to the CPU. And that's another actually pretty interesting topic that the edge teaches some organizations is that uh, when you have hard edges, you know, in your local compute, like in there's nowhere to scale to, like you're used to in the data center, you at times you actually in a non-controlled fashion make friends with the OOM killer, which is news to a certain type of programmer. Uh, so that actually resource constraints is also maybe just to go back and add, add another 0.25 to my What's, what's unique about the edge is that, you know, there's usually very hard resource limits and you have to understand and appreciate what that means to your applications. Mm. Sorry, Freddie, go ahead. No, no, that's good. That's great. Okay, so final step now. So uh, go back to my site here. Uh, I can now <coughs> see that, that this host is drained. I'm not running anything there. It's, it's, it's empty. So now I'm actually going to switch back into into uh, the Red Hat console, and I'm going to tell this guy to upgrade itself. Okay. Hit update. I'm going to choose version 7, which is the latest one, and hit update. So this typically takes maybe 30 seconds or so uh, before it, it gets the, the downloads, the new version, and, and reboots and all that. So I'm going to switch back in, in here. So momentarily, I expect to see like an alert saying that we lost contact with this host. Uh, and then a couple of seconds after that, uh, we should actually see the host coming back on. And I can actually put my application back on that host if, if that is what I need to do. Yeah, here we go. So I'm actually getting an error now that it's down. So let's give it a few more seconds. It's going to reboot and come up again. But again, even though I knew that that alert was coming, I saw that red on a dashboard and still was like, I need to do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Battle scars with, of assist admin. more integration with, with you guys uh, that we're actually interested in, maybe to be able to drive uh, like an update from our UI and so forth. We could actually know that this host is about to be updated and maybe, hmm. I don't know, a less stressful alert in that case. <laughs> I, I think some vendor should, at some point, Eric, give you uh, a, a heart rate monitor or, bo or both of you, and then lead you through uh, some sort of demo which ends in a catastrophic outage, and then oh, publish you, you guys' heart rates. <laughs> it has to be on a Friday afternoon, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. End of the week. Okay, dokes. I mean, I mean, I think this is is really cool the system that you have what i've done what i actually done now is is i've i've moved the app without uh, disturbing any app traffic that i have i've remotely upgraded the operating system it rebooted it came back online life is good and and now i can either manually do the same thing again i can i can tell it's it's uh time to update this host so i could drain that the system would then move the application once more, uh, maybe hopefully back to the to the first one, as you can see here, that is already upgraded. And then I can go back into the into the Red Hat console and upgrade the next one. And the third one I can actually do immediately since I'm not running any application there. So I can just trigger the upgrade of, of this one, go directly to version seven. But I, I, I hope you get the, the gist of it, uh, that this is really helpful to our customers that, again, as Carl mentioned, may have hosts in thousands of locations that they need to maintain. Oops, there is a CV, I need to do something. And at the same time, affecting the applications that they run as little as possible. And what we also love about this, guys, is the, let's call it the separation of concern between the platform team and the application teams. So the application teams can go about their busy day while the platform team takes charge of the tasks that they have at heart, which is to make, again, make sure that it's operationally robust and secure. 
and they don't have to actually they don't have to talk much maybe they should but you know you know what i mean it's it is a kind of ships in the night if they wanted to and we think that's a very very strong proposition here that's it so as we as we kind of start to wrap up today's episode uh, why don't you walk us through uh what what the uh, the different avasa solutions are <laughs> Sure, I guess, you know, again, at the heart of it um, is truly the um, control tower that 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 Friedrich kind of mentioned here. Um, and as, as I mentioned a couple of times, the, the agent, right? So, I mean, the, the main kind of solution is for teams that are embarking on, because this is usually tied into some, you know, infrastructure project, uh, a way of, extending their, again, technical operational capabilities here. Um, and that usually includes then all the tasks that you can imagine for um, both the IT side and the application side. And I mean, there's, as you guys can imagine, it's a, it's a painfully short introduction. Uh, there's a whole slew of other things to talk about here that actually impacts the way we integrate with, uh, with REL on Edge. And one of them, for example, is, is um, tenancy, right? So we have a deep isolated tenancy model that actually can allow uh, teams to share hosts, even adversarial teams can share hosts, right? So we can assign resources to organizations and the, the organizations only get to deploy things uh, to the resources that they've been assigned. Um, and that comes into play in, in so many verticals and so many examples where you may want to allow third party or at least different parts of your own organization onto the same substrate. You may even want to measure their consumption because you may want to charge them back and it might even be a commercial setup, right? Um, so a horizontal platform with a, a number of kind of solution vectors here. Um, and again, I think our ambition here was mostly to just make sure that we introduce the core of the system and how to interact with the with the well-designed, you know, uh, Rel on Edge substrate that that uh, really solves that update cycle for us without having people <laughs> going places with USB sticks or treating each computer as a server, right? Instead, you know, really treating them as, you know, um, well, let's call it edge cattle then. Uh, it's just something you can work with over time. And, and to your point, Eric, it's built on RPM OS3 in this case. So, Frederick, we had a, a, a last-minute question come in from Shantanu here about uh, if you're using this in a load balance scenario, does the agent integrate somehow with, say, a reverse proxy to ensure traffic drain before shutting down the older version? Yeah, so so in our system comes with a built-in DNS. So as when I did that demo, when when it went into delayed shutdown, that service instance, and we brought it up on a, on a new host, what actually happens in the DNS is that the delayed shutdown instance is removed from DNS and the new version is added to DNS. So any client uh, trying to resolve uh, that particular instance will get the new version uh, or the new, yeah, the, the new version, so to say, back from, from DNS. Uh, that can in its turn be integrated with a reverse proxy, of course, like HA proxy or, or something like that. Uh, we don't ship with any reverse proxies in the system, but our customers typically bring what they like and, and integrate with that. Gotcha. All right, so uh, let's let's go around the horn. Carl, any uh, in closing thoughts for us? Uh, I, I think the number one thing is that I think we can go even further, guys. I think, uh, uh, you know, actually doing I really think that the old, the idea here of constraint based, you know, being able to express what to do to which locations is a really exciting thing. So I'm actually looking forward to working with the Red Hat team to integrate the idea of saying, let, let's upgrade everything in Europe now and then wait a couple of hours and then let's upgrade everything with a GPU. Uh, because that will drive some really, really, really cool abstractions. And, and that's one of my favorite topics here. We need to really think about the abstractions. When you look at this edge environment from a you know application vantage point, what is the appropriate abstractions? And you know, one of the things that I, I generally harp on about is that it's not about you know IT you know details or infrastructure details. It's about the abstraction. So driving that is what I'm really looking forward to and making this a, a very comfortable environment and rant frederick 
No, I'm good. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I'll throw it to you then. Any yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thanks so much, Carl and Frederick. It was, it was really great to see how Avasa works with Rolf Edge. And I, I really like the demo and, and, and incorporating the OS update into that. Because as we all know, you know, the application is super important, but the you know the infrastructure and OS is important as well. So it was yeah. you know, really great to have you on and, and have that explanation. So thanks so much. Thank you so much for having us. Really appreciate it. Well, if you all enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, we produce content like this every other Wednesday. We're live at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and if you're a Red Hat partner, please reach out to me uh, directly. I'm the IT guy at redhat.com, so I'm easy to find just about anywhere. Uh, really been enjoying our, I don't know if I'd call it a, like a partner series, but really have been enjoying this year our, our partner-focused episodes. Um, is a, I don't want I don't want us to kind of get stuck in an echo chamber where it's just Red Hat and nothing else exists. Uh, <clears throat> having been a systems administrator for a number of years, I know that uh, it can become very difficult to try and standardize your your workload. So it's it's great to see what other companies and what other uh, what other customers and partners are doing on top of RHEL. So if you have uh, if you know somebody or if you yourself are, are one of our Red Hat partners, please reach out to me. I uh, would love to have more episodes uh, coming your way. And speaking of additional episodes, we will be live in two weeks with the head of Linux engineering and the vice president of Linux. Of course, I'm referring to Mike McGrath and Gunnar Hellickson. We'll have them both on, and I believe Nate will be joining me as my co-host. We'll be talking to them about the open source focused Red Hat Enterprise Linux development model and what it looks like, and uh, be sure to answer your questions as well. <clears throat> So that's in two weeks. Uh, this week on Friday, Nate and Scott are back on Into the Terminal. We'll be talking about how to uh, how to use uh, SystemD in in a, in a more modern operating system. We'll talk about how to convert your init scripts over to SystemD. We'll talk about uh, the the future of RC.local and and uh, and other cool SystemD features. So. Uh, I know pre-show we were talking about Vim versus Emacs, so now I'll throw out another uh, another holy war, and we'll talk about System D versus uh, versus some of the other systems that are out there. And last but not least, uh, join uh, John Spinks and myself on Tuesday. We're going to be wrapping up our uh, Insights mini series, modernizing Realm management. We'll be talking about some features that have actually come out to Insights, both in preview and in GA, since we started our 10 episode mini series. So there is a ton of content. In fact, just this morning, uh, I had a, a security compliant images with Red Hat Enterprise Linux image builder uh, tech tip video on this very channel um, in the new office. So it's my first tech tip video in the new space. So uh, please share with friends, like and subscribe, hit that notification icon because we are live throughout the week. All that said, um, on behalf of Brian Smith, my co-host, Carl and Frederick from Avasa, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you all. <laughs>